So hello everybody, welcome back to uh, one of our seminar has. Uh, today, today we have a, a special guest, uh, Maxime Pelkat, who is uh, an associate professor at uh, INSA of Rennes and uh, IOTR in Rennes as well, in France. So he is an, an author of uh, more than uh, 70 publications in the domain of digital signal processing. Uh, system design productivity, model of computation, model of architecture, multimedia and telecommunication uh, processing, parallel embedded system design and cybersecurity. He has served as a program chair of uh, SAMOS conference and general co-chair of uh, SIPS conference and he is, he is an associate editor of the Springer Journal of Signal Processing System. And so I'm going to, to let you present uh, Maxime. Thank you. Thank you, Hervé. So hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Maxime Pelka, um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, models of architecture. Uh, so I'll, I'll present after, after this uh, what they are, but uh, let me introduce a context, uh, which may be uh, a quite a classical context for you, but uh, let's see if we uh, we see the things the same way. And then I'm going to talk about these models of architecture um, and uh, the motivation for them, and then some some future work. So first, uh, where do I come from? So I uh, I'm Maxime Pelka. I'm from IETR, Institut d'électronique et des technologies du numérique, uh, and my team is named Bader. We are five permanent. Uh, uh, teacher researcher on the subject of um, architecture design uh, and I also teach at a school named Insaren uh, in Bretagne. So first uh, motivation slide. This uh, uh, graph you've may maybe seen it already a few times. Um, in in uh, orange here you've got the Moore's law which shows that uh, the number of transistors double every 18 months. Here in blue, you see that the single thread performance on a single core uh, uh, does not evolve so that much since 2005. Uh, and actually, the rate at the moment is uh, for a single uh, processor to, to, to gain 3.5% per year of, um, of uh, processing power. If we look at the, uh, the frequency, uh, we are stuck at a few gigahertz of processing. And if we look at the energy consumption, at the power consumption of uh, systems, uh, we usually do not want to spend more than 200 or 300 watts uh, inside the processor because otherwise it becomes a nightmare to dissipate the heat. So uh, uh, single thread performance frequency and, uh, and power uh, tend to, uh, to saturate, while at the same time it's the number of logical cores that uh, tend to compensate uh, for these limitations and, and continue to, uh, to bring uh, efficiency to uh, computing systems. So this is quite a, a general trend of processors, if we look at a, a system on chip. Um, and uh, processors are used in different contexts, in different systems. And actually, uh, the, the, the main um, uh, metric to, to differentiate different uh, systems now is power consumption. So uh, as a rule of thumb, between 0 and 20 Watt, we tend to talk about embedded systems. From 20 to 20, 20 Watts to 20 kilowatts, we tend to talk about dedicated system or conventional systems, and, and between 20 kilowatt and 20 megawatt of high performance computing. Uh, 20 megawatt being, being quite quite of a limit today to high performance computing because after that it becomes uh, also very difficult to dissipate the heat, which is uh, kind of the big problem at the moment in processing. And just to give uh, an idea of the constraints, uh, when you uh, dissipate more than two watts in a processor, you start to need a dissipator, uh, potentially a passive dissipator. At seven watt, you need a fan. And then, uh, of course, the more you you put uh, uh, heat dissip um, power dissipation, the more you need uh, advanced cooling systems. And something interesting at the moment is that uh, something is um, is developing, which is high performance embedded computing uh, that combines constraints of embedded computing with uh, needs of uh, high performance workloads 
including machine learning workloads, for instance, where you, you want to, to keep your power consumption under a few watts. And at the same time, you want uh, many operations per, sec per second. So you want a very, very good energy efficiency. And what we observe today is that embedded systems influence a lot both dedicated systems and HPC because they are better in, in energy efficiency. And for instance, the, the Fugaku uh, HPC system uh, of Riken, which is uh, the, the top HPC system today, is based on ARM cores that were first done more for embedded systems. So here is for uh, uh, the systems themselves. And then if we look at the design uh, efforts to, to, uh, to create these systems, what we observe is this is the most low again, that the hardware complexity doubles every 18 months, uh, more or less. And uh, so this is the number of transistors, but even if we look at the, at the architecture, it tends to uh, rise uh, quite much by adding CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, FPGA, a lot of different architectures inside the system, specializing the systems. Uh, and at the same time, the design productivity, the amount of lines of code per day that uh, uh, a desi designer can create and debug and validate and then verify, sorry, doubles every five years. So at a very, very uh, lower pace. And this is only one side of the problem because the software complexity doubles every 10 months. So the number of lines of code that we embed in system, so these are numbers from ITRS, doubles at a very faster pace. So there is a problem here at, uh, with a growing design productivity gap. So we want to design ever more complex systems. And at the same time, the productivity doesn't raise that much. So uh, this is quite a problem, which makes us quite conservative. So reusing uh, blocks that have already been validating. And uh, that uh, creates challenge for the future. So how to raise design productivity when harder complexity comes from specializing architectures to application and some software complexity comes from adding new services to systems. So more connectivity, more advanced signal processing, more uh, and, and now embedded artificial intelligence. So at uh, our team, so at ETR Vada, we, are, we have worked over the years on, on different propositions to, uh, to automate design of signal processing systems. So we look specifically to uh, signal, processing uh, signal processing applications. And we port these to different architectures that can, could be embedded in a phone, in a, a set-top box, in a, in a, a telecom base station, or med medical equipment, or, or, or all this system here. And uh, we have worked on uh, designing signal processing and machine learning applications in uh, creating data flow models of computation that express uh, the parallelism in, in uh, applications. So you see one uh, on the right here. Uh, we have worked on approximate computing, so uh, degrading the, the, the precision of a system in a controlled way to, uh, to gain efficiency on models of architecture and on hardware software co-design to, to design at the same time the, the, the hardware architecture and, the, and, and the, the application. So let's talk uh, about models of architecture, which is uh, the talk of today. So the motivation is that we put more and more heterogeneous uh, processing elements inside systems. So here, uh, as an example, uh, there is a system with four GPP, general purpose processors, with an ASIC. For instance, it can be an, uh, an ISP, an image processing uh, processor. Then we can put an FPGA, a GPU, a DSP. And we can add a lot of different elements like this to specialize the processors to their uh, workloads. And uh, to make them communicate, we will put uh, memory hierarchies, potentially quite complex with some internal and external memories, some uh, DMAs, uh, direct memory accesses. Uh, and uh, so we do that for the systems to remain energy efficient, but at the same time, we need to coordinate this and uh, it becomes quite a, a difficult um, question. And also how to choose in advance the structure of such, such a system uh, if we fix the structure, then uh, we, uh, the, the system be becomes less evolvable and more um, specialized to a very specific uh, application. 
So what we observe in, in this special specialization, it looks a lot what, at, like what has happened in the 1990s inside the cores, inside the processing cores, where first there was a unique uh, arithmetic and logical uni units. Uh, the systems have, mo have moved to SAMD, uh, single instruction multiple data, to, uh, to uh, execute several instructions, several, not several instructions, but several operations at, at the same time and uh, to very long instruction words, so putting different operations in the same instruction. Uh, but there are some, um, there are some differences um, to, uh, then, um, with respect to what has happened in, in the 1990s, is that at the coarse grain, when we put several cores today, uh, the computing cores are asynchronous. They tend to be each a master on the buses, uh, and uh, to choose when they, they do something. There is no or uh, very little centralized control of what uh, these uh, parallel architectures do. And for the moment, there is no performance portability. So every time you need to move to a new system, you need to rewrite the code. Uh, so some uh, um, uh, movements toward this, toward performance portability, for instance, is uh, OpenMP or OpenCL, but we are very, very far from having a, a large performance portability. Usually, you need to rewrite most of your code when you move to a new architecture. So uh, this was the motivation. And then uh, something we proposed uh, is to, uh, to develop models of architecture to determine the impact of uh, architectural choices on the performance very early. Uh, and to create this model is quite lightweight and reproducible uh, for, uh, for uh, being able to automate decisions at the system level. So for instance, uh, what happens if I remove two general purpose, purpose processors uh, on my system? So this is what, why there are some crossed uh, blocks on the right. And what is the consequence on different key performance indicators. So it can be throughput or latency, so pure performance, but it can be also on energy and temperature and uh, the amount of uh, memory consumption, etc. So uh, how to make a link between uh, what we decide at system level and the, the, the final performance. So to, uh, to evaluate these kinds of performance, we have three ways. We can either prototype the system, so we build it and we measure. Um, this takes time. We can simulate with system C or other languages. So simulate with functional or abstract simulation. If it's functional, we even can test whether it works or not, with, whether the application can work. Uh, so we reproduce the, the way the system will work. Uh, we can, and we can model. So this is uh, the goal of this model of architecture. And what we want to have is fast models so streamlined, uh, put the minimum of complexity, uh, the minimal complexity possible, uh, which means uh, modeling at, at a coarse grain to not have all the details of, the, of what's happening on the hardware. Uh, we want it to be uh, generalizable to a large decision space. So if we want, we can remove, add different uh, kinds of processing elements or, or communication ways, and it still gives us an answer on um, on the performance. And we want to be, uh, we want this model to be either accurate or uh, offering fidelity, which is not totally the same. Uh, with accuracy, you want to, the model to give you a precise number of performance. With fidelity, you want it to order the, the decisions uh, correctly, which means you, you, you take the right decision, but uh, you don't know by how much you gain by taking this good decision. So if we have these three, it's kind of a unicorn. So it's quite difficult to get all of these at the same time. But the question is how to progress towards this, these models that can offer uh, generalization, speed, and uh, accuracy at the same time. Uh, so uh, an idea of this model of architecture is not to depend on the application. So you can map a new application, and it still gives you an answer on how much it consumes in terms of power or how much time it will take to execute an application. And uh, it inspires from something created in the 1990s by Bart Kinwis, the white chart. So white chart is 
quite a simple idea. You, you take uh, applications and an architecture. Uh, from models of each, you generate a design, you evaluate key performance indicators, and if you are not happy with them, you, you redesign, and you can redesign application or architecture or both. And here, this means that uh, you need to be able to, to model, to describe both independently, which is not necessarily uh, an, an easy thing. Uh, and on application side, so you can see on the upper left that uh, models exist. So you, you certainly have heard and played with uh, SDF models, for instance, uh, data flow models uh, on the application side. On the architecture side, uh, uh there is uh, not so many there are not so many models available um and uh, this is the objective of this uh, effort on models of architecture is to, tr to try to develop models that can be reusable in a vast uh, number of uh, problems so on an algorithm model uh, the idea is to conform to a model of computation uh, and uh, many exist so I, I have put only uh, data flow models here, so SDF, CSDF, BDF, but there exists other mod models, uh, uh, even not uh, data flow. And these are meta models, actually. It's model from which you build models, uh, each model being uh, an, an application uh, uh, specific model. And on, on the architecture side, so we have started to create models, so LSLA, GSLA, but uh, it's still much to be ex extended, so it's a starting work. Uh, and uh, the idea is, if we get these meta models, then the tools will become interoperable. And uh, uh, the same way as uh, two tools manipulating SDF uh, are interoperable in the sense that you, you get the exact same semantics in your models. Uh, and we can build on these models to complicate them and, and make them closer to reality. So the term models of architecture was introduced in 2002 as a formal representation of the operational semantics of networks of functional blocks describing architectures. So this, there are some problems with this definition. It is recursive. So uh, a model of architecture is made for describing architectures. It allows a confusion between computational models and architectural models because uh, actually uh, the SDF model, for instance, fits to uh, can fit to this uh, definition if you consider that uh, elements are architectural ele uh, architecture elements, and uh, it needs to be transformed in models that we can reuse and and, and disseminate. So based on this um, uh, fact, we have proposed. Uh, three conditions for making a model on MOA. Uh, so the reproducibility of the, the model, you want to, that if you apply twice the same model to the same problem, you obtain the exact same result. Uh, the independence from application and the abstraction of the prediction to not create uh, 10 times the same model if it's uh, just one, once for energy and once for time. We have shown that no model in literature has these three properties. And uh, we have proposed a uh, first linear uh, um, model of architecture called LSLA. And we've shown that, that we could get some accuracy, uh, some fidelity, sorry, on uh, predicting the energy of uh, a small embedded system like this one uh, on, uh, that has eight cores. And we, uh, we, sp we spread the, the workload on the different cores. Uh, we measure the energy and we link the energy with the decisions of mapping uh, tasks to one core or another. So there are some strong hypotheses behind this uh, high fidelity. For instance, we, uh, we force the DVFS to, to, for each core to execute at its maximum speed, which is quite a strong uh, hypothesis. So if we wanted to, to, uh, to let DVFS do its, its job uh, freely, we would need a different model for each combination of DVFS uh, co uh, configuration. But it shows that it's feasible to get a very simple model and get a high fidelity on a very complex system. So this is uh, where it has been published. Um, and uh, what we obtain from this is that we we kind of see what is uh, the, the we extract the energy efficiency of each core 
from the processing itself and also the, the, the efficiency of the communications to, to handle uh, data going from one core to another. So uh, model looks something like this. Uh, let me uh, illustrate on a very simple example. Uh, we have here a uh, simple homogeneous SDF graph with tasks with four actors, so four tasks, uh, five tasks, for, sorry, that exchange data. And we want to map that to a processor with two cores, P1 and P2. And these two cores communicate through a unique communication node, which uh, abst abstracts the capacity to communicate from one core to another through message passing. Uh, and uh, we want to map the upper to the uh, lower side. <coughs> and on each core and, and communication node, we put an affine expression. Uh, and I'll ex explain what it means. And there are two steps, actually. The first step is that we transform the application into an activity. An activity is uh, an abstraction of the pressure put by the application on the hardware architecture. Uh, this activity is represented here in uh, with two levels of granularity, so tokens and quanta. And uh, a token can be seen here uh, to, to simplify as a, a function call. Uh, a, a computation token is a function call, and a quantum is a, a cycle, for instance. And uh, there are also some communication tokens and quanta. A, a token for communication is a message, and a quantum can be a byte, for instance. So taking these two levels of, uh, of hierarchy, we map the processing tokens to processing elements and the, the communication tokens to communication nodes. And from this, uh, the, the affine expression gave us uh, a cost. And for instance, in, in this case, the cost is 50. The thing is, it's going to always be 50. If you take the same hypo hypothesis, you always obtain the very same uh, measurement. So you, you have a re reproducible uh, model. So <clears throat> I'm not going to enter into the detail, but this gives you, I hope, uh, a, a good enough uh, understanding. And then maybe a detail is that when you map a, a message inside the core, uh, the message is, uh, the assumption is that the message costs zero, which is a quite a strong assumption. But it's the, the assumption made in LSLA for the moment. So here we've got three levels, the model of computation, the activity, and the model of architecture. And actually, for, uh, by uh, researching on the subject, we see that the, the, the concept of activity is actually may, maybe as important or even more important than the concept of model of architecture itself. So just to give a, a, another view of the problem, we've got an application model. Uh, this translates into a workload to be ported on a, on a system. The work, workload itself trans, transforms into an activity, which is an, uh, an abstraction, non-functional abstraction of the pressure put by application on the hardware. Then, and then at the downside here, there is a digital architecture and its hardware substrate, so the transistors themselves on, on the CMOS uh, substrate. And this all together, all these stacks create a KPI, a physical property, so either uh, time or energy. And uh, how to decompose this stack to understand uh, the consequence from uh, design decisions to the the, the hardware. This is uh, the idea behind models of architecture. So we have first shown some results on energy. Uh, the problem then was to uh, to look at latency because latency uh, is not additive uh, in a general sense. So very simply, uh, if you put two tasks uh, one after another, the latency is the sum, and if you put them in parallel, the latency is the maximum. So you've got very nice theories to study that, like the max plus algebra. Uh, the thing is, uh, then LSLA by itself could not make sense uh, if we take the whole application as an activity. So there are several ways of, uh, of taking this property of latency into account. Um, one way could be to evaluate uh, what is a critical pass at any time. So if I take the same uh, uh, very small application here, I can have this critical pass. Let, let's say I'm executing on a parallel system. Uh, 
the latency could be caused uh, from from getting a signal as, as an input and producing a signal at the input could be could come from the upper um, pass here or it could come from the down pass here or it could come from a combination of both because uh, if we cannot exploit correctly the parallelism of the system then all the tasks will enter the critical path so we've got in this very simple example already three different potential activities and uh, they can change they can depend on how the application is scheduled on the architecture um, so we have studied that in the context of the thesis of Claudio Rubatu and we've seen that by, by measuring on platforms that the problem is even more complex than this uh, because when you uh, when you look at uh, the latency of a real system actually there are also some interferences so here in blue you've got the critical path so something you can evaluate on the application itself and uh, to, to see what is the longest path between the sources of inf of data and the sinks of data and uh, you and, and here you see the, the real schedule at the end and uh, on on a, on, a, on eight cores of a system and what we see here is that the critical path is only a very small share of uh, of the latency. Uh, this is because uh, the critical path has been computed without a knowledge of the architecture. And here we are work dominated in the sense that uh, it's the amount of processing that causes latency. It's not the critical path and the dependency between tasks by themselves. And then we see a lot of interferences coming from tasks that are uh, that uh, mess up with uh, the original critical path of the application. Uh, we have another extreme case, which is span-dominated applications, where the critical path really causes uh, latency in the final system. And you see that the, the interferences are quite low. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the, the parallelism is not that bad, so the, the cores are quite well used. So this is kind of a, of a a good uh, case uh, for using well the uh, architecture and then there is there are cases in between which are the, the most common cases actually where some here you see that some processing elements are, are not used at all or almost not used uh, and uh, the latency at the end is part from uh, originally evaluated critical path but also with some interferences uh, so the idea is uh, at the end, the, here the latency is a sum. It can be evaluated by a model of architecture like LSLA. It's a, it's a sum of um, contributions of different elements. But the difficult part is to extract an activity uh, in the form of, a, we didn't call it critical pass, we called it a longest latency pass, uh, a pass of, um, of elements that together create uh, creates the, the the latency, so the, the, the duration between getting source information and, and producing information at the end. So what is the status of uh, our research on models of architecture? So we, uh, we've worked on uh, energy and latency um, evaluations on general purpose processors and on GPUs. Uh, and we have collaborated with uh, already a few people from University of Maryland, from Scuola so Superiore Santana, from Unica in Italy, from Tampere University. And uh, I'm strongly uh, convinced that there are a lot of research prospects. Uh, we are working already on uh, uh, generative hardware design, so generating the structure of a system from its applications. Uh, on performance portability from one architecture to another, because if you know what are the consequences of taking high level decisions, then you can work on uh, um, uh, automating the compilation towards different structures of systems. And we can also work at, uh, at uh, OS level, so trying to adapt online uh, on uh, an application to uh, a system to an, to an application to, together. So here are some publications if you want to read more on this and uh, don't hesitate to send me a message if you are interested in the idea and uh, you would like to, to build something together. So for the next steps, uh, uh, 
we uh, we are working at the moment. Uh, we are very involved in open hardware uh, uh, movement because uh, the open hardware and RISC V uh, initiatives at the moment open the possibility to really um, uh, specify hardware to the problems uh, to, to applications, and it opens a lot of possibilities in terms of um, of uh, 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 structures, I mean custom structures, adding custom structures and e e evaluating them. So I'm, I uh, allow myself to do a little bit of publicity. So uh, there will be the risk five week uh, from the third to the fifth of May in Paris. So if uh, if one of you or some of you would like to participate, it's going to be a really nice uh, uh, meeting. Uh, it's actually now the, the biggest event on risk five in Europe, and we organize it uh, each year. Um, there will be, uh, I'm touching wood, uh, co-supervised th thesis uh, together with uh, your team and, uh, and our team at, uh, in, at IETR. Um, so uh, the thesis of Pedro Siambra, uh, we are currently uh, requesting funding. It's already funded on the French side. And uh, the thesis is named uh, Design Automation of Data Flow Optimized Heterogeneous risc five based Systems with an MLRR Compiler Infrastructure. So it's a bit complex, but... And we uh, co-advise it with Hervé Vickel and Michael Dardayou. Uh, and I think models of architecture can be useful in this context. So let's, uh, let's see where we head uh, on this context. We have an open uh, postdoc position uh, on uh, data flow system programming for near near memory uh, stream computing, so uh, I can distribute. Uh, if you if you agree, Hervé, uh, I can distribute it on uh, on the Slack. Uh, it's two years of postdoc, uh, so and uh, with three, uh, with a collaboration between three uh, three research team in uh, in Brittany. Um, and uh, just a takeaway message. So uh, I'm strongly convinced that we need um, new abstractions to, uh, to uh, automate uh, system design. And models of architecture is one family of such abstraction. And maybe uh, even on activity, we could create something completely different uh, that would justify some, some, some domain of research. And uh, we need to work uh, uh, on many subjects that to connect them together to, 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 to reach uh, really portable, um, portable efficiency on compilation, on programming, on uh, system design. So uh, I'm very open to collaboration on this. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you very much. And thanks for the, the invitation, Hervé. Uh, the presentation was nice. So now I'm going to open for, for questions. So is there any question, guys? I have one. Uh, thanks, Maxim, for your presentation. It was really interesting. And thanks. you talk about models of architecture in, in the context of embedded systems. But uh, could we perhaps extend those models for, for I don't know, high performance clusters, like the, the, the traditional clusters, and, and try to do a modeling not only of a single machine, but multiple machines with multiple uh, devices connected to them? Yeah, I think it's very possible, but uh, I don't know that much this the subject, so uh, I, I cannot talk about it. But uh, I suppose it's uh, the constraints uh, are quite similar. Uh, maybe there are some some uh, uh, some devil in the details uh, that makes uh, the solutions uh, different. But uh, I, I, it's certainly the direction to try. All right. Uh, do you do you know if, if there there are any works that start to explore this, or, or this is basically untreaded territory? I, I think it's quite new. I've see, I've I've read something um, on HPC. I've read I, I've read something already. Uh, it it won't come back in my mind, but uh, I I can send you an email if I uh, if it gets back to to my head. But uh, on on especially on energy efficiency. All right. But uh, the thing is, uh, I think if we want to progress, we need not to not to say this is a model for energy because otherwise uh, we, we create thousands of models and uh, and it becomes a mess. Uh, if it's additive, it's additive. So it, it should be a, a, a model for ad additive property, mm -hmm. and uh, and then to build on that. And this is new territory, I think. All right. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Maxim. Thanks.
Actually, I had exactly the same question because we are working on uh, a lot with uh, HPC, uh, in, in, our, in our group, uh, not everybody, but uh, of specific project where I, I work with uh, Gustavo, we are working with HPC. So that was like a natural question. Hmm. And uh, maybe one comment, uh, the thing with, I think, high performance computing cluster is that as a difference with embedded system, uh, embedded system, you you like uh, if, if you make your system, then it, then it's fixed. Uh, with uh, clusters, I think uh, clusters are a lot more modular, so you could even I don't know change some piece of your cluster if you think. So maybe it's even easier, mm -hmm. but uh, to to do this uh, kind of modularity and uh, and not having the, the fixed system. Uh, but on the other side, uh, since it's easier, uh, the cost of changing is a, is a lot less, right? So mm. you probably need more of this model and uh, knowing before uh, with embedded systems and uh, HPC. But I think that would be a very nice uh, uh, experiment to do, to, to try to apply those techniques uh, for high performance computing. Right. And, and I suppose uh, also the workloads can be very, quite different if you access uh, if you access um, uh, databases um, like in, in a random manner. Uh, it, yeah. it can become a bit a mess to uh, to to get this activity. So how how do I model the pressure that is put on my system? Yeah, that's there is all the thing with uh, parallel file system and uh, stuff like this. The whole computer that is just here to 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 keep your data. Mm. Uh, which is uh, a, a bit different. Uh, so maybe I'm just going to to ask another question in the in the same uh, uh, theme. Um, you, you said at the beginning of the presentation that uh, embedded system uh, influence uh, HPC. Do you think uh, it work on the other way uh, around? I mean, HPC hmm. influencing uh, embedded system. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe for the use, mm, I'm not sure. What do you, do, you, do you have something in mind? Yeah, I was thinking maybe uh, parallel programming hmm. because uh, the, uh, the problem of parallel programming uh, came very early uh, with uh, uh, supercomputers. Hmm. Uh, and for example, the uh, now in H, uh, in I mean, the system we are seeing a, a, a lot more uh, calls than a few years ago, and but the, this this uh, size of uh, parallelism was already present in uh, uh, in HPC, right? And yes. So in a thing. sense, uh, on the com compiling side, and the, the it's more HPC that influence embedded system, and on the architecture side, it's uh, embedded system that influence uh, HPC. It's yeah, compiler and, and runtime probably. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, any other question? No question uh, because I have more. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you you say that uh, we uh, a bit later in the presentation you say uh, we usually need to rewrite application uh when we change uh, architecture yeah do you think uh it's still true even for uh like uh, machine learning application nowadays mm. I, I i would say it's quite true it's it's still quite true because uh, of course there are, there are a lot of initiatives uh, towards uh, portability so you, you can talk about HLS uh, to generate hardware architectures from C and try to optimize the structure of the hardware that you generate. You can talk about uh, OpenMP and uh, uh, moving tasks to, uh, to different forms of cores and, uh, and uh, uh, you can talk about OpenCL, you can talk about, uh, so there are many uh, efforts, but still today I'm, I'm uh, if you want to move a system from, uh, from uh, let's say, a uh, ultra scale plus uh, uh, Xilinx uh, solution to a multi core uh, DSP, you rewrite. Because yeah. in the end, you would, you would, you would use one percent of the performance of your system otherwise. Yeah, but uh, you, are, you are 
you are speaking of two very different systems. I mean, if you if you take one MP SOC from another, uh, for example, with an, nowadays with a machine learning system, all those systems have those accelerate, accelerators for convolution. Mm. And uh, I think, for example, with MLER, they are trying to uh, re reduce this a lot by uh, making the transformation uh, adaptive to the uh, to the targeted ha hardware. Hmm. And, and yeah, it's the, right. The, the, yeah. the advantage of uh, machine learning uh, application, I think, it's they are uh, a lot more static than other uh, than other applications. So it's, it's much easier to do. And they are very, very parallel. So you can exploit this parallelism. Uh, so it's true that for, for ML, for, for machine learning, there has been so, so much effort into automating this, then today this is not true anymore. So, so we, we have portable performance. You, you're right. Yeah, well, one thing that we were discussing the other day on, uh, on Slack is that uh, nowadays uh, machine learning is uh, influencing all uh, hardware that we have. Hmm. So all, all the, the hardware that we have in every uh, area, like I mean, the system and even uh, HPC, we have uh, machine learning accelerators everywhere. And if you do something else, you need to adapt to use yeah. those uh, accelerators. It's becoming quite crazy. Yeah, it's starting to be uh, the, the next, uh, yes. The, the, the next challenge is to use the ML uh, hardware to do something else, yes. Yeah, we uh, start to, to, to read some papers on this. Uh, and I have another question. Could you uh, put back uh, your, your slides uh, when you show the, the three? So there was the model of computation, the activity, and the model of architecture. Mm, yeah. Let's see, let's see. yeah. This Six. one. Yeah. Uh, where is uh, for you here as uh, the, the mapping scheduling of your of your task? This is an extremely good question. <laughs> because I was so, like, uh, you, you, you show the application, you show the architecture, you show the activity, which is not really uh, the, the mapping scheduling. Because if you change the mapping, then everything changes, right? Yeah. So, so maybe we could create uh, other layers, because at the moment, it's very coarse, in a sense. And the, uh, so LSLA is, it takes a lot of very, very strong hypotheses. Uh, and uh, one is that scheduling does not affect the KPI. This is a very strong hypothesis, uh, and uh, it's, which means uh, the order in which you execute task in, in on, a, on a single cord will not affect energy, for instance. Okay. So uh, we don't take into account scheduling. Uh, the mapping is uh, the uh, are the arrows here. Actually, you map uh, the tokens to the processing elements. Um, same type for timing. So whenever you time, you, you start your task uh, does not affect the KPI. And another very strong hypothesis is that here you see that these tokens are not mapped anywhere. So they stay internally to a processing element and they, we consider the cost nothing, which is a very, very strong hypothesis too. So I mean, uh, it's uh, the it's first model. And uh, in some cases, it, 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 it works. So, uh, but we need to, to build more, comp more advanced models uh, to fit the reality of other cases. So, what cases it is, it is work? Do you, do you have uh, some? So, so the, the only uh, use case we have, uh, we have shown some results uh, until now is uh, on, uh, on the multi core. Uh, so uh, eight core embedded system with uh, two types of cores. So it's a big little uh, arm. And uh, if we spread an application on it, uh, it was a, a large uh, data flow application and we play with where we put actors. Uh, we can uh, model the energy of each case with LSLA. And this is what we see here, actually. So here you've got the LSLA estimation in red. And here's the ordered uh, energy measurements on the platform. And you see that we do some errors. There are some errors. But in 86% of the time, if you ask uh, whether you should take uh, one decision or another, it gives you the right decision. So in terms of fidelity, it's quite good. Okay. Uh, so this was kind of a motivating uh, uh, case, and and then um, uh, in in the study of latency, uh, we have uh, more looked at uh, how to to get the right activity because this is uh, the nightmare for latency. It's to know what really causes the latency of the system. Okay. 
and not that much into a model of architecture yet. Yeah. So, so this, uh, in those cases, you you used uh, uh, SDF application. Yes. Do you know if uh, you talk, for example, of OpenMP? Here we we use the in our group we use a lot uh, OpenMP with tasks. Uh, mm -hmm. And did you ever try? Uh, because the difference with uh, uh, SDF is that uh, OpenMP tasks are not so predictable. Mm. Uh, so you, you split uh, the work, but for example, the communication, you don't, don't necessarily know the, uh, the cost of communication. I, it, it can depend, but even the, yeah, the, there is less predictability. And so do, do you think there is, there would be more, uh, th that would make things harder uh, to predict? Um, it depends on what you want to do. So may maybe because you could extract an activity from traces. You observe traces, you extract an activity, you send that to a model of architecture. If it fits, it fits. Uh, so uh, it's it's certainly going to be uh, more difficult to predict. So uh, to, to, to say in advance, uh, this is what I'm going to get. Uh, but uh, doing it after the execution, so from traces, makes sense also because it makes it possible to uh, to understand where the bottlenecks are, what what is really uh, limiting the performance. So I think it can be it can be done. Um, uh, first of all, uh, hi hi Maxim. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, <laughs> this uh, whole idea of models of architecture made me think of MLIR. Right now, you're using this to to predict the the use of energy of of applications, right? You just a it, yeah. it's completely parallel from the compilation process. You first uh, create this archite architecture, then you separately uh, implement the implement the algorithm, and then you measure to see uh, if it was accurate, right? Mm -hmm. As an undercut. I I'm thinking that this kind of formulation of uh, of an architecture could be useful inside of the compilation, because all of the uh, the whole point of MLIR is to separate the coarse grained um, uh, co uh, optimizations from the from the low level optimizations, right? But mm -hmm. uh, but traditionally, all of these all of the specific architecture choices are baked in, into the compiler, right? Uh, GCC needs to know about all of the tar all of the uh, targets, LLVM needs to know about all of the targets. Um, but targets that are, if not, they are similar. If an ARM are a, a board that's similar to a RISC-V board, but that the coarse-grained optimization strategies are mostly the same, right? And I was, mm. I thought that maybe, maybe we, we could uh, use this kind of like architectures to categorize our our targets and have the compiler do this do, uh, these choices without knowing the specific detail about uh, the final architecture. Just that it overall. Uh, I'm not sure if this yeah. makes if what I'm saying makes a lot of sense, but. Um, it could be it, it could be useful in a, in a standardization type of way, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it makes sense. Uh, I, the the thing is, I didn't talk about how you create uh, we create these models. So so here, uh, in the case of the platform, we we train the model. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a linear regression. To, to, to get the parameters so uh, you, you can you can say uh, I have a first phase where I train the parameters of my model and then I I, I, uh, I use the model that has uh, that was trained I suppose you can do that uh, we could imagine to do that in in MLIR at a coarse grain on the separation between coarse grain and fine grain I think it's uh, it yeah it uh, it can be a lot of uh, it's a complex problem so it needs to be thought well uh, I'm, I'm not sure I get all the uh, subtleties. Uh, I'm sure I, I don't get all the subtleties of the problem now. But thanks. Okay, any 
Any other question, guys? No? Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, we can uh, thank uh, Maxim for the, his uh, presentation first. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so let's stop recording.